Well, hello everyone and welcome to our service this morning or this afternoon or this evening, today, tomorrow, whenever. Ah, the joys of streaming. That song we just heard, by the way, was the last song we were able to record in the sanctuary together before we had to shut down again. Hmm. And as you can tell by the emptiness behind me, we're prepping for renovations this summer, so buckle up because it's going to be an interesting summer. Now, I told you some months ago that one of the good things to come out of the pandemic for me is that as a result of my walks around the neighborhood, I've gotten to know my neighbors better. Well, I was sorry to hear the other day that one family who had six chickens have sold them. Now, it's really too bad because the fun began when the chickens would escape from the yard all the time into the neighborhood and of course the kids would get sent out to get them. You've heard the expression herding chickens? Boy was it fun to watch. I called it the Great Audrey Street Chicken Run and I suspect that for that reason the kids, one of whom celebrated his ninth birthday this week, may not miss the chickens nearly as much as I will. So here's a question for the chat box. I'm curious do any of your neighbors have any interesting or unique pets? I mean, cats and dogs is one thing and chickens is another, but any cheetahs, peacocks, green anacondas, pet elephants? I mean, I hope not, but hey, type your answer in the chat box for the group. And speaking of herding chickens and things like it, this is also the time of the year when we herd together all of last year's financial paperwork. It usually sounds like, Carrie, what did I do with the T4s again? We then hand it all over to our accountants for their audit. So as we do that, can I take a minute to thank you again for your continued support to, of Bethel during the pandemic? I have been amazed at how the church continues to be blessed by both your prayers and your giving. And I and the staff, the elders and the board are very, very grateful. And please keep our accountants in your prayers as they complete this important annual work for us. Just a reminder that if you want to donate, you can go to BethelKingston.com and click on the tab called Give, and you'll get details there. We accept cash, checks, electronic transfers, chicken eggs. That was a joke. In keeping with the bird theme. And if you're new to our church, no matter where you're from, please don't hesitate to click on the connection card in Church Online. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, we're here to pray with you as well during the service. Just click on the Request Prayer button on Church Online or at BethelKingston.com. Since I seem to be on a bird theme today, I thought before we continue that I would remind you of the loving God we serve as we come together to worship. In Matthew 6, Jesus is speaking of anxiety, something we can all relate to these days. Listen to his words. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. 
They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And then later on, Jesus reminds us in chapter 23 that his wish is to gather us as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. We worship a loving and good God who really has done great things. Amen. For this week's ministry feature, we thought we'd step out of the church and talk with Rob Kiley to hear all about his life as a city councillor during the pandemic. So welcome, Rob Kiley. We are delighted that you have taken some time here to um, allow us to interview you. Now, before uh, I set up what this is all about, why don't you first just introduce us? Are you married? Do you have kids? What, what do you do? Yeah, well, thanks, Mark, for having me. It's good to be back virtually at Bethel. I attended here in the early 2000s. Um, oh, and yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. you are. So, so good to see you and everyone out there. Um, so I am Rob Kiley. I'm a city councillor. My tag is that I do that by night because technically we only have meetings in the evenings. So that's just how the city schedule works. And then in the day, I'm a high school teacher. I teach at Napanee District Secondary School. I have a, a new baby. My wife and I just had our firstborn named Samuel in March. So we're just getting into the hang of that and balancing all this crazy virtual life. So mm -hmm. the, the purpose of our interview today is really just to inform our church of what's it, you know, what's it like to be a town councillor? I mean, we pray often for Kingston. We pray for councillors, our mayor, and, and, and there's a number of people who attend Bethel who are involved in the city they love the city passionately they serve the city through some of our partnerships so first question up on the wicket here is what are some of the unique challenges that you face as a counselor in in serving the city in this season because we know being involved yeah. in politics is always hard but what are some of the unique challenges in light of covid yeah well covid has really sharpened the need for evidence-based policy so leaning on our excellent chief medical officer of health is the prime example that I like to give. We yeah. need to always be looking to experts to kind of guide where we're headed. And I mean, I personally always thought that should be true for politics, whether it's council or other levels of government. But when we're dealing with literal life and death decisions, that's like exceptionally important. And then once you get that information, then communicating that in a way that's clear and concise and that people are able to understand and cooperate with um, so it's really ratcheted up the need for sharp political communication. And I think that has been a challenge. And again, you can look at our level, the municipal level of government, provincial, even federal. And sometimes yeah. when things haven't been clear, it's actually created a bigger problem um, than we, we started with. So evidence-based policy, looking to those experts, and then for us as politicians, really trying to distill that and get that out to residents in a way that they can understand. Yeah, so now are you saying evidence-based policy, I mean, that would be true all the time, but are you saying, or should be true all the time, talk maybe just a little bit about the more suspicious culture we live in or lack of trust in terms of sure. decisions being made, thus the need for some evidence-based policy, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I mean, to be frank, it can be difficult when people feel like they're hearing different things from different sources. And I know that folks like to look online and I, I applaud critical thought and I like when people want to understand the world around them. I think that's a really good thing. But if we don't have that base trust for the people who have spent years and years of their life really refining their skills in medicine or epidemiology yeah. or even in communications, right? Like I know there've been, for lack of better term, some scandals around how vaccine information has been communicated. Um, and if, it, if critical thought and research gets us into a place where we're not trusting one another and where we don't think that the experts are experts, then I do get concerned. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that this time of all times can really kind of reaffirm our commitment to looking to doctors, um, yep. especially now. And maybe, if I'm being hopeful, that sets the tone going forward that we always know that when it comes to decisions on transit or housing, there are people who have spent so much time and so much good energy studying these things and we can really lean on them for making good policies for our city and beyond. Yeah, yeah. So so what are some of the ways that we can best support 
our counselors uh, to support you. Now you're a you're a person of faith, and so I know mm -hmm. that uh, that means a lot in terms of your worldview. And there are lots of people of faith or different faiths in town or different worldviews. But so, just speaking specifically of the church, what what do you appreciate as maybe a person of faith uh, in how the church can be supportive mm -hmm. of, of what the town town council is trying to do? So I was thinking of two responses to that to that yeah. question the first is definitely prayer i know that as fallible human beings we need god's wisdom we need his peace we need his humility in all the decisions that we're taking so if you could be praying for that and joining those of us who are on council who would be praying for those things too that means a great deal and being aware that other churches uh, around the community are doing that is actually really encouraging at, at least for myself uh, i can only speak for myself here but I'm sure for others as well. Um, yep. The other thing that I thought about when you're asking that is a phrase called the benefit of the doubt. Give, give counsel the benefit of the doubt. I'm not claiming that our decisions are perfect or that they can't be improved. And I think that they can be many times, but there have been very heightened emotions during the pandemic in this season. Um, and some of the responses that we get from folks who I thought probably should appreciate that it is difficult and we won't come up with perfect solutions immediately yeah. and rather discouraging. Um, so know that nine and a half times out of 10 politicians, like every profession are just trying to do their best. And if something's not quite where it needs to be, write us, phone us, lobby us to make it better. Of course, that's what democracy is and it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. But give the benefit of the doubt that it wasn't done out of malice or even out of ignorance. Um, and I think that we're gonna be in a much better place. So if your congregants and churches around, frankly, right now, the country could do that for politicians, I think we'd be in a, a much better place. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I totally agree with that. So you say you're a teacher mm -hmm. and you're a counselor you, and you have a young baby. You have a wonderful wife. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you balance all that? That's a heavy, heavy load because we know that teaching has drained so many teachers, exhausted them. They want to retire at 30 after this season, right? I mean, it's very challenging. There's no mincing words on it, especially because both politics and teaching are so human focused, which is why I love the professions. It's about helping people. It's about being there with them. All these good gospel principles I think you can really uh, embody as a teacher and a politician yep. don't really translate through the screen. So it is definitely taxing that way. Um, but at the same time, the way that I try to put a positive spin on it and something that encourages me to get through it is that decisions made at council and the way that you treat kids, even when you're online still matter, right? Like yeah. it's a bad situation kind of across the board. So if you can try to be a small, small light in, in any way you can, hopefully that helps. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's a lot of work and that's just where we're at right now. So as you look forward, as you uh you know we're we're hopefully moving into phase one june the 14th yes or and so much of that seems to yeah keep our fingers crossed and and pray um yeah. but so much of that is tied to vaccination counts and percentages and all that for kingston what 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 would be a concern or a couple concerns moving forward because it's not like you know I remember when when the vaccination came out, people started thinking, oh, I get my shot and my mask is in the garbage and away we go. But it's kind of like, no, get your shot and keep your mask on. So in other mm -hmm. words, there's a slow recovery here. There's a hopefully a gradual return to something. So so Kingston, what, what are some of your concerns as we move forward, realizing it's just not going to be a flip of a switch and, and we're back to normal? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. So I'm glad that you're saying that clearly because it will be a slow process. It looks like from all the evidence that we have before us and from, again, the best advice from the medical community that there won't be a fourth wave, but there might be what we're calling breakthrough infections. So COVID isn't going away as soon as everyone has even their second shot. We can still transmit it. We can still carry it. Um, but it hopefully means that our hospital system is going to be able to recover because right now we yeah. know that it's breaking point. Um, so yeah. always wanted to keep people as healthy as possible, but recognizing that some people will still get sick. We want to make sure that as few people get sick. So 
our, our systems that are there to support them can actually do that. Um, so it is a slow recovery for sure. I mean, there are some big ticket items that have always been an issue in Kingston that the pandemic has just really shone a light on. I think of affordable housing. housing yeah. How many people can work two jobs here and still scrape by to pay rent? Yeah. That's a massive issue. Helping small businesses uh, that have been shuttered for, you know, probably over half of the last year and a half. Like mm -hmm. in these waves, open, close, open, close. That's really difficult for people that put their life savings into their work. Yeah. Um, so there, there are those big issues. And I know that you're aware of like, we have a fentanyl crisis and people are overdosing and dying in our community. Uh -oh. So they haven't gone away. If anything, they've become worse because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that I think a lot about and try to do my best to be a part of, of, I guess, the good side, if you will, is how do we have these difficult discussions in a way that fosters respect and inclusion and encourages people to be part of the discussion? Because so often, and I know that the United States is the easy example here, but so often it's easy to polarize or demonize the other side. Yeah. And when you do that and when you shut people out, I don't think you can actually make the best decisions because you're not listening to that bigger body of perspective that can help you make good choices. So mm -hmm. um, whatever the issue is, I genuinely hope that we can be respectful and we can be inclusive in how we have those discussions. Yeah. And I think, Mark, you've said before, it, it's your posture as much as your position that matters yeah. um, on some of these big ticket items. And I think that I'm very aware of that now, again, people with heightened emotions um, need to see that kind of calm, steady hand making these choices. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you uh, so much. Thanks for being a leader. Thank you for investing. Thank you for having the heart for um, the, po the political arena and uh, the wide scope. As I've watched some of the town council meetings, I've just thought, wow, it, there is such a wide scope of issues, you know, <laughs> Tur turtle crossings and then you know, and, and turtles are important. I'm not, you know, belittling that, but you you have to deal with everything from such a large scope of, you know, having the wisdom and the discernment and being able to, you know, be knowledgeable on all these issues to speak intelligently into those things. So um, thank you for being a, a bright young leader in our city and uh, we'll, we'll continue to pray for you. In fact, my prayer for you is Psalm 78. You know, uh, it says of David that he he led the people uh, with with uh, integrity of heart and skillful hands. So uh, our prayer for you is that you would have, you know, real integrity in your heart as you lead. Uh, and um, and we know there's all kinds of things that 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 compromise or can threaten our integrity. So pray for that for you and all for, also for continued skill, uh, skill as a dad, skill as a husband you know, uh, as a, as a teacher and of course, as a counselor. So may God do that in your life. Amen. Thanks, Mark. That means a lot. And thanks for the opportunity. I think it's really terrific to see churches engaging in the community mm -hmm. for long. I think, especially in the West church kind of crept away further and further from the heart of society and to re-engage in that way, I think is incredibly important. So it's great to see it happening here. Yeah. Well, we try to do our best on that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the city of Kingston and for people like Rob who have taken on the challenge that is teaching, being a city councillor and a new dad. Please give him and all our city officials even greater wisdom during this time and help those of us who live in the city to help them by being good citizens so that together we may all be your son's light to the city, the nation and the world. We ask this in his name. Amen. Now, if you want to grab your Bible or phone, we'll be looking at this text over the next couple of weeks as we continue our series in, to, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Follow with me now as I read from Ephesians 4, 17 to chapter 5, verse 4. Now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. 
But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Let's pray. Our Father God, we come to you today thankful that you not only saved us, you are helping transform us with sound, practical advice as we live out our new lives as saints in your kingdom. Be with Mark now as he helps unpack this text over the next couple of Sundays. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start today with an aerial shot of our text. If you've been with us over the last several weeks, you know that we've been working through the book of Ephesians. So I want to encourage you right now, take your Bible in whatever format you have, turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and as we jump into this text, which Carmen has read to us, uh, verse 17 to 5, verse 4, we're not going to cover all that today, but I want to, uh, first of all, approach this text by kind of giving a bit of an aerial shot. And I want to read uh, the first couple of verses, and as I do, I, I want to ask you this question, do you agree with Paul's description of humanity here? So verse 17, where, again, Carmen's read this, but let me just read these few verses. This is what he says. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So let's just walk through this really quickly and just extract. Here, verse 17, he says, uh, you must walk no longer as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Now, Paul is talking to Gentiles. He's talking to a specific audience, but he doesn't just believe this about Gentiles. He believes this about Jews as well. And if you read the whole context of Ephesians or where else Paul wrote in terms of other books, it's very obvious that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But he's talking specifically in this context about Gentiles. And then he talks about the, the futility of their minds. And he expounds on that in verse 18. He says, they are darkened in their understanding. So referencing the mind. They are alienated from the life of God. They are, they are in their position to God. They are separated from God. And because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. And so the, the, the posture or the condition of their spiritual heart. And then he goes on in verse 19. They have become callous, or the word there can mean they have become numb and given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. The idea of giving themselves up is the same idea, I think, that's in Romans 1, where it's, it's this idea that all restraint has been thrown off. So, so, so Paul is, is talking about his observations in terms of what he sees, perhaps as he looks at Ephesus, the, the, the letter, the, the city that this letter is addressed to, even though this letter was definitely circulated to all kinds of cities and towns, he, th this is his observation of humanity. 
Now, it's re really important that we understand here that Paul is not saying everyone acts out to the same degree. He's not saying that people don't have the potential to do good things. In fact, Paul is not saying that he is above this. He actually said of himself that he is the worst of sinners. But, but this is what Paul is saying about Gentiles. He said this about Jews, that, that all of humanity is deeply flawed. When it comes to the relationship with God, there's this alienation from God, and that alienation or that flaw is expressed in various ways, in various cultures, and Paul is just making observations of how it is expressed in the culture that he's a part of. And so we come back to that question. The question is, do you agree with Paul's diagnosis of humanity? Not, not everybody would. For example, a gentleman by the name of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, he had a far more flattering dogma about humanity. He, he said this, there is no original perversity in the human heart. There's no original perversity in the human heart. Man is naturally good. And he said this, it's by our institutions alone that men, that make men, that make humankind wicked. It's the, the, the problem is institutions. And so you can see where what Paul says and what Jean says are diametrically opposed. One is saying the problem is institutions, that's the root problem. Paul is saying, no, the root problem is it's the constitution. It's, it's not the political constitution. It's the constitution of humankind. It's the foundation. It's the heart of humankind. And so if you believe it's the constitution of man, that man is basically flawed before a holy God, or if you believe it's institutions, then your solution moving forward will look very differently. For example, some would say, change the institutions, change uh, the policy, get better government, and you'll deal with the problem. But, but where Paul goes as we continue to read, it's not rooted in changing institutions, but rather one that deals with the constitution of humanity. And so, again, as Carmen read, we read now, verse 20, but this is not the way you learned Christ. So now he is bringing in the solution which is Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Very exclusive statement now, as he says this in a, a, a letter written to Ephesus where there were over 50 gods that were worshipped. He is saying the truth is not in all these gods. The truth is in, is in Jesus. To put off, verse 22, your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, which is seen in Christ, right, in true righteousness and true holiness. So, so when you read that, you realize that Paul has two very different people he's referencing here. In the first couple of verses, he's talking about an individual or humanity that is alienated from God. And in the second part that I just read, he's talking about that is a life that is aligned with the life of God. In the first person, there's a hard heart. But in the second person, that hard heart is replaced with a sensitivity to putting off practices that are in contradiction to the holiness and the righteousness of God. The first person is described as having a callous heart. But that's replaced by a mind that's renewed and, 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 and a spirit that has come alive. In, in the First person is referred to as a former way of life that is now contrasted with this new self that is created after the likeness of God. And that word created in verse 24 is a really important word because it refers exclusively to God's work in creation. We are his creation. That God has done a creative, transformational uh, work, a, a renovation of the human heart. Not a political ideology, not a recreation of an institution, rather God's work has been directed and focused at the constitution of man, a new creation. We are new creatures in Christ, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. And so while we would all agree that systems and institutions are broken, there is something that is more deeply wrong or, or deeply flawed about the human race. The evil humans... Paul would say, the root issue is what causes evil laws. Or as one writer says, we build our sins 
into our systems. That's a great statement. We build our sin. The original problem of our Constitution result in laws or policies that are just a reflection of our sin. An example one writer says is Heinrich Himmler, Hermann uh, Goring, and Adolf Hitler's sin of anti-Semitism wasn't just individually expressed, it was systematized into ghettos and gas chambers, or injustice is baked into the very systems of culture, of at times government. The root issue is not to change the institution. The root issue, Paul is saying, it's the constitution, it's the very heart of humanity. Now there, there, there's something more wrong than simply the institution. And so then Paul continues, and, and, um, and, and as a result of this alignment that Paul now is talking about, uh, what is the result? Well, notice he says in verse 25, therefore, therefore, since you are no longer alienated from God, the first person that's alienated, but therefore, now that you have been aligned with the life of God, now that you have put off and put on, and that's a continuous exercise. Now that you are walking in true righteousness and holiness, therefore, Paul says, is an emphatic marker of result. Because God in Christ has dealt with the constitution of mankind, what happens? Therefore, how I treat people changes. So, so do you see the flow here? In that first section, verse 17 to 24, when I give God what he is due, when I align my life with him, when I worship him, when I yield to him, then what flows from that is I will then give people what they are due. Therefore, and then he goes into, right to chapter 5, verse 4, a number of uh, attributes or characteristics of what healthy relationship looks like. Now, as I was observing this text from kind of this aerial view, a couple of weeks ago, I thought, here is a beautiful picture of what is so central to many conversations today, and that is justice. Not social justice, because that's different. This is biblical justice. One writer has said that justice has been defined for millennia as giving others what is due them. Think of that. Justice is giving others what is due them. Well, a biblical view is that, is that justice does not start with institutions, because that's not the root problem, but it starts with God. One writer says that biblical justice is giving God what he is due. So giving him our heart, giving him our worship, making him central to our lives. We give God what he is due, justice. And when we give God what he is due, we give people what they are due. We act justly. And thus Paul says in verse 25, therefore, as you give God what he's due, first bunch of verses, now verse 25 to chapter 5, verse 4, now we give people what they are due. You see, remember in the Paul uh, example here, in the context of Ephesus, there was tribalism, there was cancel culture, there was Jew against Gentile, there was a long history of name calling and of, of prejudice and, and, and judgment. But Paul says, when Jesus gets a hold of your life, Therefore, now you treat others differently. You, you practice justice. In fact, this is how I would spell justice. It'll pop up on the slide. But notice the us in justice. Biblical justice is where we, there's, the, there's the vertical piece. The us is not just horizontal in institutions. The, the us is vertical, connecting, making right with God, giving God what he's due, and then giving men what they are due. See, thus, we're all guilty, aren't we? All, all of humanity. There's no superior race. B biblical justice does not start with the oppressed and the oppressor, but with God. Biblical justice does not deny oppressor and oppressed, but it starts where we all are guilty. We are all alienated and in need of grace. Biblical justice starts with the much deeper issue. Paul is starting with a much deeper issue. So question, why is all this important? Well, for us today, one of the reasons why this discussion is so important and why to see the flow of this text is so important is because people are important. People are important. And that's where Paul's going. He says, therefore, in light of what God has done for you, therefore, treat people differently. Jew, treat the Gentiles differently. Gentile, treat the Jews differently.
So we want to spend our remaining time here just answering the question, what does this look like on the horizontal plane? And we want to look at three characteristics. There's six of them that Paul lists. We want to look at three this week and three next week. Here are the three. Truth tellers, anger managers, generous workers. Uh, th these are three statements, are, are examples, uh, that Paul brings out in this context that illustrate what we need to put off and what we need to put on and to live in the likeness of God, true righteousness and holiness. So I want you to think with me as we just walk through these. These are examples of justice being done on the horizontal plane after I have, first of all, begun with God and dealing with the root issue. So truth tellers, verse 25, notice, therefore having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Note the contrast here. There's, there's falsehood. We, we put away falsehood, or there's a practical example of, of taking off the rags of of the old self and putting on truth, which is a reflection of, of, the, of true righteousness and holiness. And, and, and so what we see here is that, is that um, putting off and putting on uh, is not some mystical condition that we have before God. Oh God, I come before you and I align my life and it makes no difference in this life on the horizontal plane. No, it makes all the difference in the world. And Paul is saying how it makes a difference is is, is now you, you are a truth teller. You put off falsehood. You put away falsehood. And you speak now the truth. And, and notice the theology of this. He says, why? Well, be, we are members of one another. He's speaking of the church. See that person over there that's very different than you, that Jew, that Gentile? Think of modern day applications. They have the same father. They have the same savior. They have the same spirit that lives in them. We are, we are image bearers of God. I think in the original context, speaking the truth had to do a lot with reinforcing the fact that both Jew and Gentile were equally loved in the eyes of God, that both had equal value and worth. In other words, when Paul is saying, uh, put away falsehood, how this had to do with justice was put away false systems, put away bad categories, labels, one race over another, and now speak the truth to one another. Instead of speaking uh, lies that ridiculed, instead of speaking lies that fed segregation or belittled, which was common Jew-Gentile, which is common today, I now speak truth that heals and that restores. This was so necessary in Paul's day. This is what justice looks like on the horizontal plane. This is what Christians are to look like when they have given God what he is due, justice. Now we give men, women what they are due. We give, we express, we live out justice. But this can take time because falsehoods of culture can be powerful. Paul is saying, you've spoken falsehood towards one another. You've spoken lies to one another for years and years and years. It's now time to tear those old clothes off, put the new clothes on, which speaks truth. Let me, let me give an illustration of this in terms of our own uh, tribalism of today. For example, in 1864, uh, the year after Emancipation Proclamation, the Sojourner Truth visited the nation's capital and was shocked by the situation former slaves found themselves in. There were still 122 pages of black codes, examples of falsehood, discriminating against the blacks. Those codes imposed a, a curfew on people of color, disallowed black businesses, black children weren't allowed to swim in the river, sit on benches in the center market, or fly kites on the National Mall. Those codes eventually changed, the writer says. But then notice this, but the attitudes behind them and the experiences of them cannot be so easily rewritten. And then he says this, it's much easier rewriting laws than it is rewriting hearts. You can change a law, but if people have been oppressed under that falsehood for so long, it has become part of their DNA, and it takes a long time for the heart to catch up to the truth. When you've been enslaved for centuries, it takes time for your identity to catch up with your new reality. Well, many Gentiles in Paul's day saw themselves according to some old code. And there were plenty of people, Jews included, who were willing to remind them of those old narratives. Well, how do we start changing the narrative? Paul says, be a truth teller. 
One of the results of having, of having our constitution changed, we tell the truth. And so the question is, where, where might we get the truth? Well, here's a clue. It's called scripture. This is what Mark Batterson says, great quote, scripture is more than a script. You've heard this before, we've used this. It's our script cure. And that's more than a play on words. Scripture confronts the false identities and false narratives perpetuated by the father of lies or falsehoods. It reveals the Heavenly Father's meta-narrative and the unique role that each one of us plays in it. Script cure. Now, we're going to look at this text later on in the next several weeks, but notice in verse 19 of chapter 5, it says, When you come together, you address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So we see an example there. They're addressing one another with, not falsehood, but with truth uh, that, that would speak of identity, that would speak of, of, of value. Acting justly towards others is speaking truth and at times rejecting the cultural narrative. So can you imagine in a situation where, for example, a, a Jew uh, comes up to a Gentile who has, uh, they've always hated, they've always been segregated from, they've always canceled, they've always always judged, and, and that Jew coming to that Gentile and saying, hey, do you know that you are made in the image of God? Genesis 2 talks about all of creation, made, all of humanity, made in the image of God. You reflect in some ways the beauty and the majesty and the glory of God. Can you imagine a Jew saying that to a Gentile? Can you imagine a Jew saying, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, or a Jew saying, do you know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that God absolutely loves you? I mean, talk about a great example of justice, where I am right with God, that us is the vertical. And now that is not some mystical, abstract idea, but it finds its, a, its application in all of my relationships. And, and what does that look like? Well, it looks like I'm a, I'm a truth teller. I'm a truth teller, Paul is saying in his context, so applicable in our context, but, but there's more that Paul talks about. So there's truth teller, we're answering, asking the question, what does, what does justice look like on a horizontal plane? Once I've dealt with my constitution, gotten right with God, Paul's saying, man, you've got to be a truth teller to one another instead of falsehood. Secondly, though, you need to be anger managers. Notice in verse 26, be angry. I like that. <laughs> Be angry. Oh, but, and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, there are a number of interesting things here. But before we jump into that verse, just pause here for a second. We're talking about anger managers and this issue of justice. Do you think that uh, this has much to do with injustice, anger? Do you think that anger has much to do with not treating people as they are due? But Paul obviously did because he brings it up in the context of Jews and Gentiles. Do you think this would be a priority to deal with in order to see greater justice? What are your observations? Well, notice the text. He says, he, he, says, he starts in the positive. Be angry. In other words, there is a righteous uh, expression of anger. But do not sin. I, I know some of us, we, we, we so associate anger with sin, anger with harm, anger with abuse, that to say anger, be angry, but don't sin, is like saying to someone, go jump in that pool, but don't get wet. It just seems like an absolute impossibility. But, but notice what he says here. He, he goes on, he says, so there is a righteous expression of anger, uh, so, but in anger, don't sin. And then he says, don't let the sun go down. He's using a metaphor, an image. It's not literal as in, you know, sun goes down, all we got to deal with my anger. No, the principle here is don't let it simmer. Don't let it simmer. Why? Because when you let anger simmer, it can lead to sin. <laughs> when you let anger simmer, it can lead to sin. Simple. The, the illustration I think of is when we make bone broth in our home and uh, we let it simmer for 12, 24 hours sometimes in a crock pot. And what happens, it simmers, it bubbles, and it extracts all the nutrients out of the bones so that broth, which is great for soup, is supposed to be really, really nutritious. Well, if we allow anger to simmer, it will extract all the sin out of the bones of our anger. And what happens? Anger causes emotions to get out of bounds over the fence to treat people unjustly. Can you see how simmering anger causes us to treat people unjustly? For example, have you ever said, look, I'm sorry for what I said. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm sorry for what I said. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm sorry for what I did, but I was just so 
you fill in the blank, angry. How many people have not been treated justly because of anger? Apparently there were a few in Paul's day. Hey Jew, stop being so angry with the Gentile. Gentile, stop so be, being so angry with the Jew. Because in that anger that is simmering, you are treating people unjustly. You are not giving them what they are due. How many have had torpedo-like words that were fired out of someone's mouth hit them and strike them and crush them and wound them? Anger was what launched such devastating words. See, we don't let anger simmer because we know that anger sabotages healthy relationships and can actually feed a bad cultural narrative about the value and the worth of people. And I know many of you have stories, unfortunately, of where anger was inappropriately expressed, perhaps by a parent or a friend. Things were said, you were crushed, you were wounded, it was hurtful. And it was not an example of justice. Giving, what people, giving people what they are due. The, the context here Paul is talking about is justice in the sense of the positive. Giving people what they are due, helping them understand value and worth. But he says, don't let it simmer. And then notice he says, don't let the enemy leverage it. Verse 27. Now, I just find this interesting what, how Paul draws this in. Why not talk about you know, the enemy, the devil, in another one of these attributes? What, what is it about anger? Did, did Paul see something in himself that suggests that you know, he struggled with anger, or, or did he see anger in the Ephesus context or in that culture? H have you seen how the enemy can get to you via anger? Maybe anger to the enemy is like a weak part of a wall around an ancient city. A lot of the ancient cities had walls around them, and the enemy would get in by finding an access point. And once they got that access point, man, they could gain entry in. I think we'd all agree that if the enemy can find simmering anger in our hearts, then he's gained an access point. And when he gets that access point, Paul calls it an opportunity. Or uh, in the Greek, it's an opportunity, or it's a place, or it's a chance. Literally, do not give the devil a chance to exert his influence. It's a weak part of the wall. I, I, I don't treat people justly when I have unrighteous anger. But before we move on to the final point, notice here, Paul does talk about good anger. And so, and so maybe we, we need to get more angry when we see injustice. The biblical narrative about the worth of human beings being denied, perhaps Paul is saying, you know, be angry. Hey, Jew, be angry when you see the cultural narrative making Gentiles second-class citizens. Gentiles, be angry, righteously angry when you see your fellow Jew, whether they're a believer or not, being treated like a second-class system, some kind of unhealthy, uh, perverse caste system. you got to get angry about that stuff. So there is a place for anger. Perhaps we need to have a little more anger in our culture, righteous anger. So two questions. Where has my anger devalued someone? I'm guilty. We're all guilty of where at times our anger, unrighteous anger, has actually crushed someone, demoted them, devalued them. It was happening in Paul's day. Where do I need to be more angry about injustice? Because the context here is injustice. So justice, justice, uh, justice biblical. I'm the us is I get right with God, vertical plane. And, and that's not just some mystical, abstract idea. It has implications on the horizontal plane. Paul is saying to his audience, this text is speaking to us in our context. The application is, is now we give people what they are due in the, in the utmost most affirming sense in this context. We, we are truth tellers. We are anger managers. And then as we wrap here, we are generous workers. Notice in verse 28, let the thief no longer steal. So apparently this was a problem, but rather let him or her labor. Get a job. Doing honest work with his own hands. And then this is just a bizarre statement. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. I mean, this is an incredible contrast, as are the previous two. Notice the contrast. You're a thief, but what I want you to do is work. And I want you to have an honest living but then he's got this zinger, so that you can help people in need. 
So notice the contrast. You move from indifference to compassion, from taker to giver, from self-consumed to other-centered, from me to we, from reservoir to river. But notice he says, do this for what? Someone? No. Do this for anyone. I love that word. So move from indifference to compassion with anyone. Move from being a taker to a giver with anyone. From self-consumed to other-centered with anyone. From me to we, we being anyone. Move from being a reservoir to a river for anyone. Not just your own tribe, not just those of my own social status, not just those that I think deserve it. Paul is saying in this context, anyone, justice, give people what they're due in this affirming sense of this word, anyone. Now just pause here and think, I don't think we're always great at this. For, for example, when you walk into a room crowded with people, who do you talk to? Do you talk to anyone? <laughs> or do you tend, do I tend to look for a person, you know, that I know, you know, someone that might look interesting or you would be comfortable with? I don't think we're always good with anyone. Sometimes our fear, sometimes my fear, prejudices, sometimes our prejudgment, sometimes our lack of confidence, Sometimes our pride don't allow us to be very good with anyone. But what happens when we are generous with anyone? That's the particular context here. What happens when we're justice, when we're justice, we're, when we are generous with anyone? You know what happens? Justice, in the context that Paul's using it here. This is how it's stated. When we treat that person, whoever that person is, with justice, we can help anyone feel like someone. We can help them feel valued and loved and cared for. And I know that the example here is monetary in terms of, you know, you're working and now you, you can be generous. But I think the application could go to, to not just my financial resources, but my time and my talents and my, and my words. We are, to, we are to bless. I heard a great story. Someone told me this uh, just last week, a really, a really simple story, but a powerful in how, uh, how, how we can minister to anyone and help anyone feel like a someone. This person was uh, downtown Kingston, saw this guy on the street lying there, and he, and he went and ministered to him. I think he gave him a, a cup of coffee or something like that. The next day or the next couple of days, this gentleman who told me the story and did the good deed was praying, and he prayed for this person, anyone. And uh, later that morning, he, he went to McDonald's to get the most excellent coffee. Of course, it's McDonald's coffee. And while he's standing in line, he looks over his shoulder, and guess who just walks in? Anyone. And guess what this person did for anyone? He bought him breakfast. And guess what happened to anyone? <laughs> anyone felt like someone. See, when we share with anyone, we can help them feel like someone. Maybe as we allow God to lead us to anyone and make them feel like someone, that will be the first time in a long time that they have been treated justly, as Paul is using this word, giving people what they are due, treating them with value, to treat someone as they are due, a fellow image bearer, whether they're a Christ follower or not. See, every day our, our, by our words and our actions, by all of our resources, we either help people feel like anyone, which is the negative, or someone. Do this for anyone. Because when you do this for anyone, I think Paul's getting at this idea that when you do this for anyone, you act justly and you help them feel like a someone. So great question when you find yourself in a context, whatever it is, who, who is the anyone in this room? Who is the anyone in this room? How can I make them feel like a someone? Someone asks it like this, how can I add value to a person's life? And so when I think of this, now maybe this, I didn't run this illustration by my wife, um, so hopefully it makes sense. It makes sense to me, but you know, may, maybe I can help someone, when I add value, maybe I can help uh, someone who feels like two cents feel like a buck. <laughs> or, or maybe as I'm walking into a room, someone who feels like $10 feel like 20 bucks. My, my point there is we add value, and it's not that we can solve the whole problem, 
someone that goes from feeling like two cents to a buck will still has a lot of work to be done on them, right? In terms of sensing their value. But maybe I can add just a little bit of value to that person's life by, by, by what I say, how I say it, by, by how I position and posture myself around that person, by my countenance, by my tone, by how I embrace that person. I can add value. I can help anyone feel like someone. I can add value. So justice, biblical justice, this aerial shot of this text today, we see in the first part, this idea of, uh, of us is, the first part is the us part, is the, it's the vertical. Biblical justice begins with giving God what he is due, and Paul makes that point. We are, we are deeply flawed. It's not just institutions, it's, it's our constitution, but Christ has made us new creations, and it's when we give God what he is due, then verse 25, therefore, and Paul now says, now you give people what they are due. There is the vertical justice, there is the horizontal justice that is expressed in the first three of the six. We'll look at the next three next week, but we are truth tellers, we are anger managers, and we are generous workers. And so as we conclude, let me, let me make a comment about Christ, and then let me make a comment just quickly about how this applies. And I, I, I'm sure you can see all kinds of application here. But, but first of all, in terms of Christ, you know, uh, Christ is the ultimate example of justice, giving people what they are due, in how Paul's using it here. Jesus cared for those with disabilities, the poor, the sick, the demon-possessed, the lepers, and others who were considered outcasts from society. It's interesting in verse 21, Paul says, the truth is in Jesus. The truth is in Jesus. So, so if you want an example of a truth teller, where, where, where on that particular issue of identity, Jesus comes along and helps under, someone understand their value. If you want an example of, a, of, of righteous anger as opposed to unhealthy anger, look to Jesus. If you want to see someone who uses their riches, their resources to bless others, to add value, look to Jesus. You can look to Jesus and see the perfect expression of all these three points this morning or this afternoon that I've shared with you. Christ is the embodiment of this. The truth is in Jesus. But last point, last question. What one of these resonate most deeply with you? Which one can you more fully embrace to live out justice this week? And I know that from week to week it might change, but I think for me, as I've reflected on this, it's, for me it's just the anyone, someone. It's so simple to do. That, that when I go into a meeting, when I walk down the street, when I find myself in whatever social setting, how can I just help anyone feel like a someone? How can I speak to help anyone feel like that because they've been in my presence, because I've interacted with them, they feel like value has been added to their life? And, and don't be fooled for a second to think that that anyone is the person on the street, the person sleeping on the street. No, the best dressed, the most successful, the most valued to our society can be that person that you need to add value to. Because in their soul, within their heart, they're broken, they're wounded, and you have a chance to add value. For me, that's the application. How can I add value? How can I make anyone feel like a someone in whatever context I find myself in. It just takes so little and can make such a great difference. So justice. Might we put into flesh the words of Paul this week? So Lord, I pray that you would enable us this week to live out justice. And I pray for anyone that's listening today, if they have not given you, Lord, what is due, which is the worship, their heart, surrender. I pray that even right now that they would say, God, I want to, I want to give you what you're due, and that is my worship, my life, my, my, my will. I submit, I surrender to you. I choose to put off the old and put on the new. I choose to move from being alienated from God to being aligned with God. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us as we are right with you to live it out on the horizontal plane. And Lord, we confess that way too many Christians, way too many churches 
have confessed being right with you, but been a mess on the horizontal plane and actually have been part of so much injustice. We repent of that. Might our, might our loyalty to you and our love for you and our worship for you find direct application at thousands of points along the horizontal plane as we love people this week and we live out justice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.